Hello. Hi. So you're Rose Rickaby. Thank you for accepting this interview. Okay. So you're Professor of Biogeochemistry at the University of Oxford, and your research focuses on ocean biogeochemistry and the carbon cycle. Uh, could you please describe your career path? Okay, I started out as an undergraduate at, at Cambridge and I was fortunate to study natural sciences where I thought I wanted to be a chemist, mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, through that degree path I was able to explore some other sciences, one of which was geology and I was initially drawn to it for the, for the travel aspect actually, yes. um, but then I found that I was uh, enjoying really both chemistry and geology, I enjoyed the imagination of the geology um, and I enjoyed the rigour of the chemistry mm -hmm. and so this was what made me start to think of geochemistry as a potential oh. Uh, next step um, and I then decided to carry on with a PhD in this area of geochemistry and in fact paleoceanography with Harry Elderfield at Cambridge uh -huh. um, and he was a huge inspiration I think I was dogged by quite a bit of uncertainty as to uh, my next career step um, because I'd seen a lot of people in postdocs just staying in that postdoc I realm see, yes. and I thought oh I, I need to have a career path I need to have some stability uh, but Harry really was very good actually in talking me through that and helping uh -huh. me to develop some confidence. Okay, um, yeah. So I went to Harvard as a postdoctoral researcher with Dan Schrag, who was inspirational in quite a different way. He was a big thinker about very big questions. And yeah. although perhaps I didn't write as many papers at that time, he really started me thinking about some of these bigger ideas and was inspirational in that way. Um, and then I was fortunate, after just two years of postdoc, to be offered a position back in Oxford, mm -hmm. um, where I started as a, as a faculty um, a member. Mm -hmm. And I've been there ever since, and I have to say that's been a fantastic department for me, very supportive in the early stages. Nice. Um, and I found it a, a wonderful place to explore interdisciplinarity actually and so okay. I, I work now with with plant scientists and zoologists and chemists and so really cutting across the departmental boundaries. Oh, wonderful. So as all scientists I'm sure you've faced various challenges in your career. Could you give me one example of the most exciting challenge and maybe how you overcame it? Um, I, from a scientific perspective, yes. um, I would say that I've been um, working in this world of proxies where we're trying to use these very rather indirect measures okay. of the environment to mm -hmm. try and reconstruct past climatic change or past environmental change. And it's been rather an empirical approach where one uses the modern day data, you compare it to your modern day environmental mm -hmm. parameter and you say, okay, I have this relationship, I'm going to apply this in the past. And I found it slightly um, uh, just unsatisfying actually, is that one is, one is eager to get the climatic story, yeah. but often the proxy itself can break down because we don't fully understand it. Um, and what would I say, I, I, I've tried to overcome that by a totally different approach, which of course now has its, its own downfalls, but I was fortunate to go to a Frontiers um, uh, conference, which brought together people of all different sciences, um, from people studying black holes to people studying genes. And I was really inspired by this concept that genes of, of living organisms today actually hold a history of their evolutionary um, uh, uh, record uh -huh. and so my current approach to trying to think about the past has been to try and look into the genes where we actually have a, an excess of information but it's a matter of trying to decipher that information okay. to understand how the environment has forced adaptation in those genes and so this is an alternative way of, of trying to reconstruct the environment in the I past see. so I that's see. that's that's really, and it, again, it's a rather fortuitous pathway that you just get struck by inspiration sitting in something that you think is totally irrelevant mm -hmm. to what you're interested in, but yes. it, it, it suddenly points a, a way to a future direction. Great. Mm -hmm. This year at Goldschmidt uh, in Montreal, you have been awarded the Paul Gast Lectureship by the European Association of Geochemistry and the Geochemical Society. What does that mean to you? <laughs> uh, it means a huge amount, actually. Yes. Um, I think 
as a scientist, one can, it, it, it's quite a roller coaster emotionally, actually, because yeah. one is, well, one is writing papers and one is writing proposals. Yes. And often one is being criticised a lot because that is what the peer review process really is trying to do. It's trying to improve your work, but mm. in that process, one can be criticised and said, oh, you haven't thought about this or you haven't considered it in this direction. So it's a very helpful process. Mm. But emotionally, you can actually feel a little bit damaged by some of this. You say, oh, God, I haven't thought about this. Or, yeah. and, and, so, and it's actually quite rare to get a pat on the back in academia and, yeah. and to be told that some of the work that you're doing really is worthwhile. So it means a huge amount, actually, to have that recognition. And... and when I look at the previous recipients, I feel rather humbled, actually, that I shouldn't really be amongst those, <laughs> well, those realms of people because their, yeah. their work, in my opinion, has been utterly stellar. And um, yeah. it's, it, So it's a huge honour. It, it's wonderful to have the recognition, but it's also, in a sense, it, one has to then think, gosh, I really need to continue working at a <laughs> level that can... Uh, honour that. Yes, yeah. put some pressure on that. Yeah. Can honour that award. Yes. yes. Well, congratulations. Well, that's very, very kind. Thank you. Keeping a balance between your professional career and life can be difficult. So, how do you manage it? <laughs> I think the answer is I don't actually. <laughs> okay. um, I, when I started my faculty position in Oxford, mm. I would say that I spent many years living and breathing science, and okay. actually the. My balance in life was rather askew. Um, I, uh, having said that, I enjoyed it immeasurably. I mean, I think yes. having that ability to just indulge in mm -hmm. one's curiosity 100% of the time is fantastic, but it can, I think, take its toll rather personally. Um, last year, I've had a son, and I think that's been an interesting thing because it's almost the only thing that has forced me to try and find some balance in life and mm. it's hugely rewarding but hugely challenging, requires endless amounts of energy but um, I would say that probably as a human being I'm slightly happier now that I have more of a balance between okay. a family life and, and, a, and a professional life. I see. So what advice would you give actually to young female researchers specifically regarding this issue of balance between career and life? Um, my biggest comment is to stay true to yourself and what you feel you want to do. I, I think from my perspective I probably held off from thinking about family for quite a long time because I was so absorbed by science. Mm -hmm. And now being on the others, and, and I worried a huge amount about having a family and how that was we going did. to impact yes. my career. And I would say that actually it would be best if everybody thought that anything is possible, that you can have a child and I think you, I think you can have a career, I mean I'm only one year in and I'm, so I still have to yes. test it properly, but I think you, you can have it, it takes energy, it takes support from partners or extended family and I would mm -hmm. emphasise that immeasurably um, that you really it, it's so helpful to have a support network mm -hmm. around you when you have children and um, but I think you can do it and, and I think what, what I would also say and I, I want to say this sort of strongly to females is when I joined Oxford as a faculty member I was really the only young female there and I would sit in rooms full of men who were very uh, Egotistical, or not, not that's not that's not the right word actually, but were very pushy about what they wanted, their ideas, and I was sitting there thinking, crikey, I, I don't know what I want, or you know, wow. what my particular yes. opinion is on this, and and I was quite, um, I felt quite shy and unable to put myself forward, but really because I didn't know the system and all of this, and I think the one thing that I've learned through that time is I would look at others and think, oh, I wish I was like so-and-so, I wish I was like so-and-so, and then I'd look much better. And I think what I've learned is that actually being myself has been my most powerful uh, characteristic and where I can be most persuasive, and that actually being yourself is all right. That's the one thing I want to say. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much for these words of wisdom. <laughs> I don't know if they're words of wisdom, but they're, they're words. <laughs> Thank you, Rose. Thank you.